presenter is uh, Patrick, and Patrick, I'm going to mess up your last name here, <laughs> Ponza with PAI, and he's one of the consultants that has been working with you on the analysis uh, portion of this, and, and really some of that data that has been feeding into the vision that Eliza gave you a preview of earlier today. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Patrick. And there's a clicker here. Thanks very much. Okay, I'm going to be fairly light on information about myself because that's not what we're here for today. My name is Patrick Ponza. I work with GAI, as Mary indicated. Uh, we have been working on future land use analysis throughout for to a county-wide effort for some time now in, pre in preparation of providing data and information for the Envision 2045 process. So that's really what uh, our piece of the puzzle was really all about, okay? So I want to show you guys a few things. Essentially, what we put together, listen, I have to apologize because this is not synced up. Um, all right. So, all right. We worked on analysis of nine major areas, okay? I mean, you can see them on the screen here. Everything from economic development through to utilities and transportation, it was all done through the lens of the future land use map. Uh, the big picture for us was what does, land, uh, what does the future of land use look like in sort of different contexts within Seminole County, okay? And that's gonna be you know, the ones that you're familiar with. We have centers, we have corridors, we have countryside, and, and we have conservation areas. And the outcomes of that for us are essentially, we had nine technical memos that we provided to staff, okay? And there are really six primary insights that I want to talk about today that provide some information for the Envision 2045 process. And here they are right here. They are growth of population and jobs, effectiveness of con conservation and policies, I apologize. This is moving. I don't know what we're going to do. Sorry, technical difficulties here. We're going to. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Thank you. topics for us and that's what it led to essentially was those outcomes we did nine technical memos in each of those areas the staff has those they are extremely dense today we're going to talk about six primary insights that we gathered from that process in order to inform the envision process these are the six insights growth of population and jobs we know that this is a topic of discussion this is a reality for Seminole County effectiveness of conservation policies again um, if you have any familiarity with the comprehensive plan or if you're just a resident or a business owner, you know that conservation is very important to Seminole County. Related to that is the density of growth, that growth that's incoming. This presents certain challenges to mobility. We took a look at the existing transportation and mobility network and a look future and how that influences land use in the future. We looked at availability of residential land, of course, to answer a few questions there and address some of those topics. And then ultimately, we also looked at what we call mixed and multi-use development opportunities, and that kind of plugs into this in, um, a little bit in the future, and I'll show you how. So the first one of that is growth of population and jobs. We know the county's growing, okay? It's growing, it's going to keep growing. We, there is an estimate of about another 38,000 additional homes that will needed by, be needed by the year 2045. So, couple maps that we've put together I want to show you to kind of illustrate that growth and how it's coming along. We look at land cover, exactly what's on the ground today, and we see that the county has been growing and the urbanization of it is seems to be happening in the right places. 
And this map kind of shows that a little bit better. You can see the gray on the map. These are your suburban uh, areas, the dark gray areas, and you see your lighter greens. These are your preservation and conservation in rural areas. And we're really focusing in there on where the growth is happening and what form it's taking. A big step that we took in our analysis is to take a look at land use of, uh, across the county, not just in unincorporated land, but within the municipalities as well. And in order to do that, we took the future land use designations of the county and applied them to all of the land within the city. So that was done. We just sort of crosswalked that through research of all the future land use categories in the cities. And we created this map for ourselves to work with as a basis for the, for the future land use. So that's just a little bit of information about how we were able to look at land countywide through sort of one regulatory lens. And here's a little bit about the numbers that we spoke about earlier, those 38,000 dwelling units, essentially what that translates to and where it came from are population estimates that we're using uh, across the board and which allows us to sort of hone in on that increase of dwelling units that's going to be needed in 2045. Well, a little bit about the demographics here. We know that the county population is growing specifically in prime home buying segments. Okay, uh, so looking at how things have changed from the year 2010 to now, uh, we understand that that sector of, of the demographics is growing, and that's important to know when it comes to, to planning for housing demand. And speaking of that housing demand, we took a look at new construction uh, as percentage of homes sold. We know that that's continuing to steadily rise, but of course an important question for us is, well, what do those products look like? What do those homes look like, and, and what form are they taking? So the chart here, is really just illustrating a process that we went through to understand what has been built in Seminole County over the years in terms of housing products. At the bottom there, you'll see the green. Those are your single, your traditional single unit, single family detached standalone homes. Okay, and then in the orange, we have uh, multifamily. Uh, there's a pattern that I just want to point out here because there's a lot going on in the data here but it's important to understand what could potentially be coming in the future. That sort of cyclical up and down spiking in that orange section, the multifamily, that's a very typical uh, pattern where multifamily residential projects are built um, and then they go through a period of absorption. So you may not see as many being built on the ground, but that's because the rental absorption is happening in that. And we see this sort of cyclical pattern happening along sort of a 10-year pattern. Um, and it looks like uh, that is going to continue on. The other important thing that I'll point out about this specifically is that the proportion between single-family homes and multifamily homes or single-family uh, attached homes, more like the townhome units and stuff, is changing. Uh, we see much less single-family being built in Central County. That's a factor, of course, of uh, how much land has already been developed, how much is left to be developed. But it's an important thing to keep in mind when we think about growing, uh, preparing for growth in the future. So geographically, we see that this multifamily construction is taking place primarily on the edges of the city. So now I'm talking about the county land itself. And that makes sense, right? It would happen on the periphery of your urban centers uh, as it is. So the next uh, group of insights, I've grouped these two together. Uh, effectiveness in conservation policies and density of growth. Because these are very, very much related. So we, we see that more than 97% of the growth since 2000, it's happened within your urban service area. And for any of those who are not specifically familiar with that, that is essentially the land in Central County that is not part of the rural charter area. So that's important to understand. Um, we know that the density of that growth is changing as well. So the urban footprint, the amount of land that's been developed since 2000, it's grown by about 8%, okay? But the ratio of people on each one of those acres has increased by 17%. So you've got more people coming in on less land. And in terms of the overall goals of Central County and, and conservation and just making sure there are enough housing units for those coming in, those are good signs. That's the right direction to be heading in. Um, taking a look at where that growth happened, I'm going to kind of jump over a few of these maps because um, in, the, in the interest of time and getting through all the topics, but essentially what came out of this for us is that we wanted to see exactly where this was happening and where the change in land cover was really happening. So these dots of red that you see all over the map here, that's land that changed to an urban use from an otherwise, maybe it was 
um, undeveloped or, or a low density residential um, type of use. And this is land that has been developed in an urban character. Uh, there are good signs about this. We see that it's not so much happening in the rural charter area. It is focused on some of your existing rural centers, and it's got a fairly good dis distribution throughout the county. The next one here is talking about urban footprint and really its density. So it's sort of difficult to see um, the minutia of this map, but the gist of it is essentially where you see the darker colors. This is where that denser development is happening. <coughs> Much the same again, you see it happening near the urban centers, but also something here to notice is that it is happening fairly consistently along the corridors as well, your major transportation corridors, I-4, uh, et cetera. The next one that we explored was challenges to mobility. Uh, we know that arterial connectivity, your major roads, is, is pretty good across the county. Uh, we discovered a little bit of uneven local connectivity in places and some limited transit. And this could potentially pose some challenges to development and redevelopment. We'll get into that a little bit more as we kind of show what the transportation and the mobility network looks like. So this is the this is the bare bones of the mobility network we're looking at here. We have a very well connected network of your highways, those are your arterials. You have a little bit of connectivity breakdown at the local level. These are the local streets. Um, examples like cul-de-sacs and gated neighborhoods. Um, while they may be desirable in particular uh, for particular reasons, there are other consequences of that in terms of connectivity of the network itself because it creates some breakdown there. As far as transit goes, um, Sonoma County is blessed for Sun Rail stations. That's a phenomenal thing. Okay. Um, we also have some Lynx routes running. You see those in pink. We have a couple areas hatched there in pink that pr uh, represent some of the neighbor link areas, I think it's called, the neighbor link. Um, the main takeaway that we take from looking at the mobility network is that it's it's developing. It seems it, but it is primarily focused along the primary thoroughfares. Okay, so it provides alternative modes of transportation along those major thoroughfares. Uh, however, uh, there is a sort of a lack of feeder network into that. The multi-use trails again, Seminole County. I would consider, I'm, I'm an avid cyclist, uh, I love Seminole County trails. It's a phenomenal trail network. Uh, it's very extensive, it's got great connectivity, it provides ample recreational opportunities. Uh, however, uh, when you look at some of how this trail network could be used in other ways, we want to look forward toward creating some um, more forward direct connections to transit hubs, such as SunRail, uh, to increase the utility of that network for uh, regional community. So when we roll all this stuff up, we kind of look at it and say, okay, well, what's, what's going to be the best and the most informative way for us to look at the street network? And there's a great data set published by the EPA that allows us to look at a street intersection density per mile. And that's what's shown on the map here. So again, darker colors, more density, lighter colors, less dense network. Essentially what this is doing is allowing us to start to use this data to interplay with other pieces of information and see where we might find some either mismatches or some areas where there's some really great cohesion. Generally, if you have more intersections per square mile, you've got a denser network, it's more connected. Generally, that's going to lead to greater mobility. So we look at this in relationship to where the homes are. And the dots on the map here are showing relative residential density. Okay, and then what comes out of that for us is okay, well, we are looking for mismatches or cohesion. Incongruent areas where you might have high residential density and low network density could present opportunities looking forward to provide mobility improvements. And you'll see those areas in the sort of darker, uh, darker pink areas, sorry, darker blue areas. Now, on the flip side, we also looked at this to say, well, what about in the other direction? What if you have sort of low connectivity or high connectivity and low density? Well, then maybe you could afford to get some more homes in that area. We took a look at where job, where people are coming in to work. 
at Seminole County. The big takeaway from this is essentially Seminole County is retaining employees. People live in Seminole County, they work in Seminole County, but there are also obviously major regional draws and employment hubs, so your transportation network becomes very important there. In the other direction, Seminole County is bringing in workers from all over Central Florida. Okay, so that's stressing more and more importance on the, on the connectivity of the regional network. Uh, access to jobs by car, this is influenced by regional hubs. We see a lot of that on the south end. Um, the big picture here is when you look at this just at transit, it sort of breaks down a little bit. This is an area for, for improvement in the future um, for the envision process to be focusing on. Uh, this is the same picture with jobs. I'm going to kind of skip along here. I want to get to this last group of insights here. The availability of residential land and mixed and multi-use development opportunities. So here's the big picture, the big takeaway that I think a lot of people are very interested in. Uh, through the analysis and through the number crunching and all of this map making, et cetera, um, what we land on is that we know that there is a large amount of vacant residential land within the county, okay? that can be used to address these residential needs in the future. Um, but we know that a lot of it is also in what we're calling the preferred development area, and I'll show that to you on the map. The next piece of it is that we know that a significant amount of that land is residential land that's in mixed-use categories and in the cities. So here you'll see what we're calling the preferred development area. It's outlined in pink there on the map, and it's essentially the central core of the county. This excludes the rural charter area, it excludes the econ protection area, it excludes the Wakaiba protection area. Um, and that's a very important point for us because our first take on this, we wanted to see, well, what does this really look like? Best case scenario. Do you have enough land to fit the people that we think are coming here with residential development that is realistic, all the while maintaining and achieving the conservation and rural uh, preservation and rural character preservation goals of the Seminole County land use plan and the residents? And the answer in short is essentially yes. Uh, there are a lot of numbers that go into this and it's feeding all into the envision process so that that data can inform the, the, the decision making and policy making process. But we know we land, we started with knowing we have about 38,000 units that we need. This sort of uh, table here is, is explaining where the land, vacant residential land is available, what the capacity is, and we see right there on the bottom right, we're ending up with a range of about 34 and a half to 43 and a half residential units within the preferred development area. That's the major takeaway from our residential land use analysis. Okay, um, we have a couple, we took a look at where that land actually is. We know it's centered around the urban centers and corridors. We know it's more, more distributed along the corridors and centered on the, on the urban centers. Um, the secondary look that we took at that is, well, where's the non-residential land? Because you bring all these people in, you gotta make sure they have jobs. Um, there's a lot of square footage available for non-residential development, commercial, office, retail, et cetera. Um, and the big picture takeaway from this is that this data supports the look at the future land use plan looking forward through the envision process to ensure that the goals of the comprehensive plan can continue to be met. So with that, I will hand it back over to Mary. And I know I kind of whizzed through all that, but I will be on the panel um, following. So if you have some questions specific to that, I'll do my best to address them. Hey everyone, my name is Alex Navarro. I'm from Jacobs Engineering. So we are currently working on the transportation mobility plan for 2045, which supports the Envision 2045 process. So I will be going through some of our updates for this plan. So first off, so first and foremost, the, the transportation mobility plan is a subset of the Envision process, and that's why we are here. Um, we are taking the mobility portion of what the Envision process is to identify the needs and the growth of Seminole County from a transportation network perspective. So we are a big part of that. Um, it also includes the existing capital improvement projects from uh, Seminole County in 2022, along with some of the other studies. So we are consistent with everything that is being done here as well. So walking through the project schedule, currently we're at the top of that schedule. Um, we have just started the process of establishing our goals and framework. 
um, which we want to make sure are consistent with not only county policy, but also the envision process and the comprehensive element uh, for transportation for the comprehensive plan. So that process is underway. Um, we are going to be meeting with county staff and um, talking about the different visions and goals for the mobility plan. Um, coming up after that, we will be developing a needs plan based off of the analysis of, of our, our models in looking at 2045, where are the mobility needs, where are the transit challenges, as, as has been discussed a little bit earlier, some of the land use um, challenges as well that uh, we face in the county. After that needs list is developed, we will go through project evaluation, which will prioritize these projects based on the different um, the different contexts and the type of projects that they are. Um, we're looking holistically. I'll go through that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, the next step will be determining funding sources and figuring out what is a cost feasible project. We may have all these good ideas, but if we don't have a mechanism to pay for it, we definitely want to make sure that we are putting on the table projects that um, are feasible and can be built in some of county. And then at the very end, we will have a final plan of our findings that have a cost feasible plan along with all of the data to back that up. So some of the goals that we're looking at, uh, first and foremost, safety. And these goals are rooted within some existing county policy and um, some existing documents that, that we have gone through already as part of earlier plans. We're really wanting to take um, a long-range transportation plan, which has done, been done in the past for Seminole County, and moving it forward towards a mobility plan, looking beyond just the roadway network, looking at transit, trails, and whatnot. So first and foremost, safety and security for all mode users, um, looking at crash sites and, and preparation and design through emergency response, making sure that emergency response is part of the conversation as well. And then how we operate these facilities, how we how we take care of them. Seminole County has uh, a very robust uh, traffic engineering uh, team that takes care of traffic signals, and um, you know that's a, that's an integral part of making sure that we're operating safe and secure. Next uh, is enhancing the function and performance, effectively sustaining and enhancing the performance and reliability of the network, making sure that. If we have a large event in one of the cities or um, in the area that there's traffic congestion, that we can handle that. We can, we can work at the local level. We can work with our law enforcement agencies. We can work with county staff to make sure that there are plans ready and available to, to take care of some of those larger scale events. Next would be progress, as you've heard before, progressing transit, rail, and multimodal services, not only having them available, but also making sure that there's connectivity um, and compatibility with schedules and also increasing the network as well. Next would be equity, uh, preserving and boosting access and economic opportunity for all users. We obviously, um, with the, we've heard a lot about um, the centers and quarters concept, making sure everything is consistent with that so that we drive um, the economy as well because part part of what um, drives the economy is mobility and when that mobility component is there, we drive people to come to Seminole County. Protecting and preserving the environment and quality of life, big theme, um, not only the rural urban boundary but also the protected areas, the econ area and the Wakaiba area, making sure we're consistent with some of the constraints that are in policy, and then not only that, but also looking at what, what may need to be in policy to move that forward. And then last but not least, um, again, economic vitality and regional priorities and connectivity, making sure that we are consistent with federal, state, and regional opportunities, and also Metro Plan as the overarching, um, overarching MPO in the area metropolitan planning organization, making sure we're consistent with some of the initiatives in their in their plans, and then also neighboring counties for adjacent areas. 
So our first step, which is in the very early stages, existing condition analysis, before we figure out what we need, we need to know where we start. So we're going to be looking at land use and zoning, which, which is a big topic, uh, population and demographic trends in the area, travel patterns, existing traffic volumes, where, where are the congested areas, um, infill and redevelopment initiatives, we talked a lot about that already in the, in the first two sessions, um, high crash locations, focusing on that safety element of traffic safety as well. And then pedestrian and bicycle quality level of service, making sure uh, there's a very robust trails pr program here, and there's a lot of ambition to expand that and, and also increase sidewalk connectivity as well. So we'll be, we'll be taking a look at that as part of the analysis. So also coordination with ongoing studies there on the north end of the county. You can see the, uh, the star right above Lake Jessup there. That's the Lake Mary Boulevard corridor study that we will be coordinating with. Um, down a little bit further south, you've got two different studies going on in the county. Um, Oviedo, City of Oviedo has their 10-year mobility plan, which we will be coordinating with. And then a subset of the mobility plan is the East Urban Area for Seminole County, which encompasses basically the area north of UCF. Um, adjacent to Seminole County, there is a Northeast Orange County Transportation Area Survey that is, or study that is being done uh, by Orange County, which basically encompasses the areas around UCF, but also adjacent to Seminole County and the, and the East Rural Area. So that one's a very important one, even though it's outside the county, it does affect obviously um, some of the consistency, making sure we're adhering to the regional consistency in the area as well. So the 2045 traffic model, we're going to be basing our information based on Metro Plan's update of their model. They, they typically update their model every five years. So they, they implement all of the capital improvements that are in that uh, five-year term. Uh, both at the county and state level, so state roads are updated in this as well, so we can have a good idea of what 2045 looks like and what we can do to improve that. Um, also, uh, traffic analysis zones are updated as well as part of that, which are basically subsets of, of land that um, trips are generated out of, whether they're walking trips or vehicle trips. Uh, and those are also updated as part of the model that we'll be looking at. So what are we looking at as far as mobility goes? What, what kind of things come out of a mobility plan? So um, identifying future mobility needs comes from a variety of different sources. You basically, any way you can get somewhere is identified as a mobility need. So those types are bicycle and ped. Uh, pedestrians, including the trail network, which we've discussed, um, very robust system and, and very great master plan to base uh, some of the future needs off of that uh, has been a great help so far. Micro mobility, um, smaller personal use, um, motorized vehicles, that's, that's a big, big topic as well. Intermodal connections, looking at the connections between the Orlando Sanford International Airport, Port of Sanford, and Sunrail stations, not only from a passenger and vehicle perspective, but also from a freight perspective. Um, looking at the traditional roadway approaches, um, context sensitive improvements, which include um, you know, different types of restriking projects or improvements to the operation of the area, maybe adding, adding or subtracting parking from a roadway. Um, to increase that flow and, and make sure that, that the area is functioning as it needs to be. TSMNO, that's Transportation Systems Management and Operations. This goes back to maybe traffic signal improvements, making sure um, on, on a corridor, maybe like Red Bug Lake Road, that you have um, consistency between the traffic signals, uh, looking at retiming uh, traffic signals so you don't, uh, when you get the, the evening rush, you're, you're getting the green lights as consistently as possible, making sure that we're running the transportation network as efficiently as possible. And then obviously, of course, uh, traditional capacity improvements where we can. Um, obviously, you know, uh, capacity in land is hard to come by, especially in the, in the urban area. 
and uh, but we will take a look at that and see what the needs are to to address the mobility of Seminole County. In the transit area, uh, signal prioritization has been something that's been used by Lynx. They use this in downtown Orlando for Lynx, so um, branching that out into some of the arterials uh, on the transit network that's already existing here in Seminole County, and then making sure that schedule reliability is there between SunRail and Lynx buses, making sure that if you arrive on a Lynx bus, you're not waiting an hour for a SunRail train or vice versa, you know, making sure there's compatibility compatibility there. Um, emerging, emerging technologies and infrastructures, looking at automated vehicles and then also electric vehicles, making sure that the government has both city, county, and state, or all, city, county, and state all have the resources and availability to consider these new technologies that are coming. So in closing, um, prioritizing these mobility projects, obviously there, there is a process here with making sure that we, we are getting out there, getting out in front of the public very early on. Um, we will be engaging in, uh, in uh, public outreach and then also making sure to involve our stakeholders, which county, state, um, individual entities, large employers, all, all the different um, areas in Seminole County and then um, obviously we're in the process of establishing our goals and evaluation framework which will develop our needs list and then we can figure out how we can pay for it and make sure that we are ready for 2045. And with that I will take it. and that is it. <laughs> Good afternoon everyone. Uh, You've heard it before, but welcome. Um, I'm going to give you a very high level view of the Trails Master Plan just as a warning, or better yet, to, to let you know you don't have to take pictures and all that good stuff. This is available on the county's website for download. You can have as much as you'd like. Uh, there's a lot of information in here, but I'm going to give you kind of a taste of what that covered, what the process looked like, and what's in the, in the master plan itself. So, without further ado, Anyone remember what was going on in about April and May of 2020? <laughs> it's one heck of a way to kick off a huge master plan effort. Um, but that took us through 2021. We adapted and we all survived, um, at least through this process. Um, we adapted and changed the process to fit. So we had a lot of folks that were corresponding with us um, through non-traditional means, let's put it that way, but we've all learned how to do that. Um, one of the other things that this also uh, uh, happened was it showed us during the pandemic, how important the trail system as it stands today is to the, to the residents of Seminole County. Because we went ahead and took a look at comparing the months of March through May of 2020 with the previous year for the exact same trails. And this is what we saw. That's a lot. So, number one, fantastic thing to have. Secondly, and while I said it's one heck of a time to go ahead and start a master plan project, we had more than willing participants that involved, were involved in this process. So that being said, um, we launched the project, we took a look back at the vision that brought us to today. And this particular graphic is one that was constructed or created back in 1996. Uh, and it laid the foundation for our three of our, what we call our showcase trails at that time. But what it really did was cement the vision for what it is we were trying to do with these trails. And really what it did is it had a number of goals. And it wasn't just for recreation. It was to also create connections between neighborhoods. And part of our transportation system, this was the envision, that it, would be, that it would become part of our transportation system where folks can use this not just for enjoyment, but can also use it to when they go shopping um, and go to parks, you name it. You've heard a lot of these things uh, as we've gone through um, today's program. And then certainly, last but not least, enhancing the quality of life for our residents. So we want to do it. We want to do it right. And we took these exact same goals and we projected them forward. Um, part of that process then said, how have we done? So we looked at each one of these, these four elements and we used those as sort of our guiding principles as we went through the process. One of the things that we did also is you need to take, take a look at what we have right now. So we know the vision, we know some of the, the backwards history in this. Now, how, where are we today? And there's a number of things that are happening around us that will affect us. Specifically, we've got a number of statewide regional trail systems that are plugging into ours. Now, this is great for places like Volusia, and I love Volusia, so I'm not knocking on it. But 
they've been able to use this effort to help build a lot more trails and kind of catch up to us, if you will. The main trail systems that we have that run through Seminole County, both the, the Cross Seminole Trail and Seminole Wakaiva, will be plugged into three different regional systems that are being constructed through the state that will literally be able to take you from Coco all the way to St. Petersburg, to points north, to St. Augustine, and all of it using and available to our residents here on our trail system plugging into surrounding counties. It also includes the Florida Nat National Scenic Trail that runs through our county. So we are, I, I hate to use the term ground zero, but we're in the middle of this regional effort that is developing around us and will continue to do so. So right off the bat, we needed to make sure that if we're following our four goals, that we're making these connections and we're making connections to all of the places that were listed as part of our original vision. All the land uses that you've heard about today, schools, parks, natural lands, civic centers, downtowns, libraries, sun rail stations, you name it. And making sure that we have all of those documented while we look at our existing trail system and some of the trails or improvements that we have, both proposed and existing, on our existing roadways. And that generates something that looked like, um, I don't know, measles, <laughs> chicken pox, whatever that might be. At a county scale, this can be a little daunting, or better yet, yeah, it looks like we threw confetti on the screen. What it allowed us to do then is to zoom in close and look at each individual area and really work those areas and make sure that we have the connections and we have the ability to make connections now and in the future. Going through that process, it also laid out that this is no longer just about three signature trails. That in order to be successful in the future, we're going to need to expand the reach of those signature trails. If you want to think about it as these are our interstates, if you will, where all the major traffic flows, they're pretty well uninterrupted as they move through the county. Pretty much majority of those corridors are old rail lines. And we need to make sure that how do we make those connections safely from those highways, if you will, down into the neighborhoods, almost like you would a roadway system. So we ended up with one, two, three, four, five different categories or hierarchy of trails, starting with the top signature trails. The, this is what you know today. Wide right of way, again, they used to be mainly rail lines that have been preserved through our original vision. And now we've got those, and we've done a good job of developing those throughout the county. Some of the physical characteristics that you see there, I've highlighted the one on the bottom. This is one that continues to be a moving target. Um, when some of these trails were developed originally, we had wonderful uh, tree canopy around some of them. And of course, over time, Mother Nature has different ideas. So at this point, we need to start looking at adding shade where we may have lost them in the past. Those signature trails, we look for other opportunities. We've got uh, on the top part, the S4, that's the river walk as it's being developed. The county is working on extending that all the way out to the county line, uh, right around where Lake Mary Boulevard crosses the river. Um, that is a project that is underway. We've got another opportunity using some power easements throughout the center of the county on S5. So we may not be completely finished with our signature trails. Excuse me. Actually, Sherry, can I bother you for some water? <laughs> um, but we've got some more work to do. Now, while these, the, the actual trail alignments go from county line to county line, there's a number of projects and a number of, uh, thank you. I was supposed to bring this up with me, so my fault. Sherry Williams, by the way, everyone. <laughs> Sherry, Sherry was actually, uh, um, I had no hair when we ended this, this process, and she was in danger of losing some of hers because she was trying to manage this through COVID. So it was an interesting journey, let's say the least. Um, but back to the signature trails, we come up with a list of other improvements, uh, both safety improvements, as well as improvements to corridors, as well as uh, additional trailheads. So that was the Seminole Wakaiba Trail. We've got recommendations for the Cross Seminole Trail and for the Flagler Trail on out east. The proposed trails through, through the Lake Monroe Trail, which I talked to you about, as well as the Central Seminole Trail. So all of these are within the trail master plan and we've tried to put some dollars to them as well so that as we go forward, we at least know what the scope of those projects could look like. That brings us down to what we call our pathways. Um, these are kind of the wide sidewalks, eight foot to, to eight, to, eight foot to 10 foot sidewalks that are occurring within right, um, 
try it again. Right road right of ways. Got to come up with. I just have to say ROWs. Um, but the idea is that these are on our, some of our major corridors. These are also some of the areas that ARPS will have uh, existing links to our signature trails that some folks can use if you live on one of these roadways that has a wide sidewalk where you might not feel as unsafe riding on a wide sidewalk as you would say maybe in a bike lane. Well, we came up with a whole different set of those on areas that are underserved that do not have linkages to our signature trails and how do we get folks from their homes to some of those same areas we talked about right off the bat that our signature trails took people. So we've got 19 different roadway corridors and projects that are listed within uh, the overall master plan. So that kind of gets us the next level down. These are some of the major roadways that you saw highlighted on a map uh, just, just with the last pre two presentations, if you will. Then we start to get down to kind of the, the more neighborhood scale of things. These are, we'll call these our corridors or connectors within these corridors. They're pretty much narrow sidewalks, and this is one up by Seminole State right now that's within the road wide of, right of way. Again, they're all within existing uh, road right of ways. Uh, but the, the, the types of the connections and who you're connecting to is really important. These are the ones that go right into the neighborhoods. And the idea would be is that you get on one of these smaller smaller trails and move, move your way up to where you end up on one of the larger trails throughout the network. There's a lot of those in the plan. This really gets down to making individual recommendations that feed themselves into the mobility plan going forward, as well as any future roadway projects that we have in the county or any of the cities for that matter that say, if we're going to follow through with the creation of or the further furthering of this network, these are the, some of the roadways that we need to look at to make them both safe for not just motorists, but for pedestrians and anyone on a bicycle. So again, a very long list of projects that came out of those. Last but not least, we had this sort of, uh, uh, we had this little project going on called Rolling Hills, if you've heard about the golf course of the county purchase. And one of the concepts with Rolling Hills was to create a loop trail, about a four mile loop, but you're gonna come back to the, your start, if you will. It's self-contained in a large park. And as we continue to look at those, we saw there's, there's some validity to say at some of our larger properties, especially our publicly owned properties, could we replicate this idea that says if you may, maybe are not going to send yourself on a, or your family on a sidewalk trip on your bikes, at least you can maybe drive here and then ex have that trail experience within a self-contained network, if you will, or a destination that can be part of your exercise, a part of your recreation, and your enjoyment of trails throughout the county. And just with this master plan, we picked up 11 different spots in which the county could take advantage of existing property that they own to develop these trail systems. So they might be in properties like this. This is a softball complex in San Lando. Now, could we create a small spur that comes off the main Seminole Wilkava kind of Trail that says if you don't want to have to go three miles down and then back again, you can take a self-contained loop and that could be your exercise, for example, for recreation. Well, that's, that's a mile and a half right there. And we use existing trails that are there. We just go ahead and develop those fully so that not just folks that are, walk, that are used to walking on gravel can enjoy, but for folks who maybe need a, a paved experience as well. So that's an existing project. This is a new project that we just started working on right now, taking an existing county asset and putting a loop trail around it as a amenity for the folks within those neighborhoods where they currently do not have access to that amenity. That's an 89-acre lake, folks. And we're looking to turn that into the next great park, if you will, with the trail in Seminole County. And I mentioned Rolling Hills. Um, four mile loop establishing there, and then if you've uh, obviously been following the news, the county acquired uh, Deer Run at the end of, of the last year, and we'll look to do something very similar there. So the idea of that as these things mature over time, they mature just like our trail system will mature. So that's a whole other 20 miles worth of possible trails that we can have countywide at county owned facilities and county owned parks. And certainly, last, not, certainly, last but not least, we have about 80 plus miles of wilderness trail for both hikers and mountain bikers and you name it. Um, we are looking to continue to expand those. They're all marked currently, and those will be part of our system going forward. All told that when you look at this entire plan as it goes forward, we've identified a mere $92 million worth of projects here in 2021 numbers. In 2022 numbers, it might be twice that right now for anybody who's trying to get anything built or constructed going forward. So 
all in all, the idea is to once again take the next step as how do we continue to link folks with the original vision that we had back in the 90s and continue to develop this so that this becomes its own system of safely knitted together trail system for folks to be able to literally take either themselves or a bicycle from, from their neighborhoods to any of these amenities and places of business throughout the county. So that being said, that is your really quick overview of what's in the Trails Master Plan. Again, if you just go to our, go to our uh, county's website, right in the middle, when you're on the homepage, it says, what are you looking for? Type in Trails, that'll take you right there. You can find a place to download the PDF of this entire report. And with that, thank you very much. We're going to bring back all the presenters. So if you are one of the presenters, you can come back up. We're going to lift up the screen here and uh, have our panel discussion. And I'll invite Eliza back up as well. So the short answer on the recommendations that are in the Trails Master Plan for each of those corridors, yes. Um, we took a look at what the existing facility looks like now and said what will it take to get to sort of our more idealized version of that that says, you know, everything from what the width of the sidewalk is, uh, are there is there shade trees, for example, present, those kinds of things. Um, and then added also kinds of things that say, is this on a route where we need additional signage to let people know that if you took this street two blocks, you'll be at this destination, that kind of a thing. So the short answer is yes. Okay. So I see hands. And I see you next. Um, yeah, I just had a follow-up again on the, the trails. Uh, yeah, the vision was, uh, back in 1997, to have neighborhoods within one mile uh, of connected trails to, to get to the trails. You know, it's come a long way. Uh, I do want to be specific. I live up in the northwest quadrant of the county, where a lot of development's gone on uh, between Oregon, Orange Boulevard, north of 46. And when I was on the PPAC, we talked a little bit about uh, getting those folks up there, a lot of those developments uh, don't get hit the threshold of them in the recreation uh, requirement. And to get them a method in a way across 46 safely and hook into the Seminole Ohio. Uh, some discussions have been about using uh, corridors, utility corridors. Um, and I'm not sure if that's come to fruition. Uh, and uh, I, I know uh, a big part of the vision that started back in the, the mid-90s was uh, the Rodney Force Commission of Congress, Commissioner Morris. And uh, he, uh, I, I think he'd be just thrilled with what we know right now, uh, if he was in the room, I think just as many as good stuff. Well, one other quick question I noticed when we connecting, uh, now we're kind of parkways getting done, and the connectors going over to Lake County, it, it, it picks up you know, an incredible uh, amount of connectivity, which uh, is uh, great. But it's pretty unsafe. Uh, the, the trail itself is literally right next to the, the roadway. Is there any thought about putting up some barrier protections, like you know, small concrete vertical pieces? I, I, I've seen that other places. I think that would give a little, level, uh, a little bit more level of safety concern. I may mean, get into the details, but I don't know if that's included in these things. My concern on sidewalks next to next to roadways is that we don't have vertical protectors, and, and that makes it quite unsafe. We already have uh, a loss of life there on uh, longer, long market road. So, thank you. I think what I'll, how I'll answer that is is that it, with each one of these, and, and you're right, Greg, I don't want to get too depth, too far into the weeds on any one corridor. But with each one of the, these corridors that we had looked at as part of the Trails Master Plan, the, 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 the greater degree of detail that you get on each one of these corridors, the more difficult it's gonna be. So by any stretch, just because we've managed to find lines on a map right now and then try to put numbers to those, um, that does not discount the fact that there's still a lot of work to be done on pretty much each one of these individual corridors. Um, so this at least gave us a direction it said which ones, which which of these roadways really need to be uh, need improvement to allow for safer pedestrian um, and bicycle connections. Um, but it then at least opens the door to a number of those. And uh, the way I look at them is these are individual projects now. So in the master plan, you'll see each one of these corridors has its own literally its own project sheet. 
um, that says, if we were to tear this out and put it right into the CIP, here's sort of your outline on the different things that we need to, we need to address on each corridor. And in this case, being able to then hand that over into this process and, and really allow that to, to find its way through this process, I think, uh, is the way that we're going to get there. Um, lots of hard work still to be done. Uh, and that's part of the reason why we're here today as well, is to make sure that we're, we have the momentum going forward. So I don't know if that answers your... Yeah, I have to ask you, Jim, I, I understand. There you go. It, it is a phenomenal trail. Uh, it's just that the system uh, is... I think we knew at the beginning this is going to be a central part of connectivity throughout the central part of the state. And, and, I'll, and I'll add to that, um, first off, I, I, I'm not taking credit for any of it. Um, you know, this was done way before my time here. Um, but the, the idea that we would start to receive complaints because of traffic, trail traffic, <laughs> not, inter, not, not cars, no, no, getting complaints about trail traffic, especially through the pandemic, that actually became one of the biggest things, biggest issues that we were dealing with at the time. And we're still continuing to look at going forward. Um, we got a study going on right now that says we may actually need to implement some traffic calming measures on some of our trails. <laughs> I would never have expected 10 years ago when I came to the county that that's the conversation we would be having. But it's a good spot to be in, I guess, to say that yeah, our folks love and utilize our trail system. And uh, can we quickly go through and introduce the, the folks who did not present who are on the panel? I apologize for not, not doing that earlier. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Tom Ross. Um, I'm a traffic engineer with uh, Jacobs Engineering, and I'm working with Alex on the uh, 2045 mobility plan. Yes, my name is Tony Nelson, and I'm the deputy county engineer for Seminole County. And I introduced Mary, because Mary and I work together all the time. <laughs> um, you got a question? Yeah. Um, I also want to I just wanted to say, uh, Ms. Uh, my name is Andy Ritchie, this is Tammy Ortiz. We are with Sci High, which is a magnet program at Seminole High School. Part of the reason why we're here is to sort of uh, explore some opportunities for our students to get engaged in real world problem solving. So just, just wanted to come with that. I'm hoping to talk with a lot of you about um, ways that we can get um, connected with the school with real things that are going on uh, out in our county. Um, with that said, I did have actually a specific question uh, as a resident of Sunrail County. Um, the, the Sunrail was mentioned, the idea of the Sunrail being kind of a major artery and transit system. Um, I was always curious about uh, any kind of thoughts about feeder systems into Sunrail uh, throughout the county that would make it a little bit more accessible for people that are maybe a little beyond walking distance. So, um, yes, yeah, so that's generally, in, in kind of transportation speak, uh, the last mile connectivity. And so we're working with our, our other transit partner links um, to, to look at those solutions. So, um, you know, whether it is a, a trail solution, a, a bus solution, or, you know, because it doesn't make a lot of sense to uh, drive your car, get out of your car, you know, take the train, and then once I get off the train, I don't have a car, how, how am I going to get to where I want to go? So definitely that is something that, that we're looking at and, and looking at working with our, our transit partners on, on achieving that. And I know it was so long ago, but uh, do we have any land use questions <laughs> for our earlier presentations? <laughs> speaking about the comp plan having already included um, uh, information regarding how to how build, know where to go, okay? Is that part of how Shelby grow? That's the first part of the question. And if it is, is that where you're saying it's there but we never implemented it? So I guess this question is for me, but Mary can certainly <laughs> feel free to jump in for my one o'clock presentation. Um, so the county did intentionally, so the How Should We Grow was a regional visioning effort. Who, who knows How Should We Grow? I do. Oh, okay. So about half, maybe a little over half. So that was the regional visioning effort that took place circa 2006 to 2008, um, which included Seminole County as well as a uh, seven county region. Um, and Seminole County, you know, I was part of some of the implementation of that through Metro Plan coming out of 2008. Um, but Central County did a very intentional job of incorporating how should we grow into their comprehensive plan through the centers and corridors, which are actually two of the four um, 
uh, goals within the Charles Trudeau plan, the other ones being <coughs> countryside and conservation. Conservation, um, which, the, which in fact, some of the planning is already doing through the world boundary before how should we grow. So um, I think that answers. So, so yes, the county has done that, and then we're we're saying what you know what do we need to get from policy to implementation. We're in the places that hasn't actually happened yet, even though it's allowed by policy. And that's because of how did we grow, that we didn't grow, to the, how shall we grow? Well, so, yes, so, <laughs> so how did we grow was the most recent effort from the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council and kind of evaluated, did, did we live up to the plan? And in some areas, we did, and in some areas, we didn't. And, and so I think that's one of the things that we want to focus on and, and why we're having this, these conversations, why we're doing the roundtable conversations is we have these policies in place, why are they working or why aren't they working? And, and are there solutions that we can find to, to make sure that they are being implemented? Okay, I have another question, but it's uh, Charlie Green here. Uh, so Eliza and Patrick were both presenting, um, I'm sorry, Eliza and Patrick were both uh, discussing, uh, Patrick was talking about the availability of residential land. Liza has presented the core areas where it's anticipated that development will happen. And what I noted is on the core areas where, uh, particularly on the 415 area going into Osteen, it shows that that's a, a core area, this very core area. But you know, I look at that area and that's a very wet land, it's very uh, environmentally sensitive. And so I'm wondering if there's an opportunity to go back and look at what you've charted for the future and make some changes to fix that we do not want to get into the water. We do not want to have to spend the money to, to fix what we can screw up because we thought we were smart. Um, and, and I'm always one of those people who has to fix because I thought I was smart, so I'm speaking for myself. But um, the other part is, is when we're looking at this and we're looking at 2045, we look at what Patrick presented is there any discussion that's talking about how to change the future land use with regards to densities and intensities in areas and redirect some things that would have been set for residential to commercial? Because I know a lot of the meetings that we go to, we've got residential areas wanting to be converted now to commercial, we've got commercial areas wanting to be to residential, and half the argument is, is the residential people say, don't put that commercial next to me. And, and these are the arguments we're having. So I think Patrick can answer the yep. water question. Yep. I'll start with the first one. I, I've got some good news for you. Um, <laughs> because as we're as we were preparing to do that really high level look at, at available residential land, um, of course we cannot feasibly go lot by lot and determine development envelopes. But one very important step that we did take was take Central County's environmentally sensitive lands layer. It's a, it's a data layer that's defined by the comp plan. And that involves, it includes a lot of those wet areas that you're talking about, okay? So not only is it the designated wetland areas, it also includes the buffers the, uh, required by the regulations and, and even some of the floodplain zones. That acreage was never included in our calculations. So it is one of the assumptions that we made uh, right at the beginning to ensure that we were not essentially putting homes on environmentally sensitive lands. Uh, the, the second part, the second piece of your question there, um, which I'm... Yes, thank you very much. Uh, a little bit of insight into how we came up with our total capacity counts and addressing these potential changes of land use Etc. Um, now, of course, our part of it is not to make decisions about what the future land use may be of any particular land, but rather to inform the county and help them uh, make those decisions in the future. Um, we took a status quo look at things. The, on the existing, which is a little confusing to say, existing future land use designations, um, uh, we wanted to see what was happening in the past. So we took a look at, well, how close to the maximum allowable residential density have these lands been developing at? Uh, what are some of the assumptions that we should make in the future as to how that might happen? And that can kind of inform the county about well, what are some of the goals that you should have for, say, your mixed-use development areas where they may not be really reaching capacity of, of how many residential units you can put on them. 
As far as changing from residential to commercial, I do just want to, I don't think that I can address that question specifically, I'll, I'll, I'll let Mary, but I do want to take the opportunity to stress the importance of the lands that are currently designated for mixed use um, and, and mixed use development. Because those are our opportunities to sort of relieve that pressure and, and they're flexible enough to sort of allow the market to respond to both the residential and non-residential needs um, as, as, as necessary. Um, is that, okay, okay, good. Okay, so the questions, I see two more questions. I think that's gonna be it for questions. And we're gonna have a longer question period after the Natural Resources Panel. Fred. I thank you very much. I'm very impressed with all the work and the presentation, so thank you very much for all that information. Um, a couple things. You talked about uh, rural enclaves. There are three of them that you, you mentioned in there, and also out in the rural areas. Um, I know it's rural does not necessarily mean it's a natural thing, because you have five and ten acre ranchettes that really disrupt um, wildlife corridors, and I think uh, something like conservation subdivision would really help where you cluster the homes even in, in a rural area and everybody has even more land. And conser uh, conservation subdivisions might work well in the, um, in the urban enclaves that you're talking about to preserve more open space yet still have the same number of, of residents in there. Um, I don't know whether you're considering something like that. The other thing is um, your, your sun rail stations, I think, can really be um, worked on more. I know there was a HUD grant uh, several years ago for the two stations that y'all are, are involved with. Them. The Sanford station is still, I don't know if it's in Sanford yet, but it was in unincorporated Seminole County and then the, the one near Wynwood down south. There have been extensive plans uh, about different scenarios for development. And I just don't know to what extent you're considering that information, all the data in your land use plans now. Um, one other thing with trails, I noticed that um, the listing of the destinations just didn't say employment centers. I saw Sunrail in there, but it seems like riding to work would be something really good. Riding to the Sunrail stations would be good because they do accommodate bikes on Sunrail. So I'm just wondering to the extent that you're considering all that. And I will say we are having work group sessions later in the day where we can dig into all of these things in a little more detail. We're advertising that at 3.30. So with that comment, I will say yes, all of those things are being considered. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to dive deep into that. <laughs> okay. I have two, sh I have two short questions. Uh, Rick, I wanted to know on the Rick, I'm on trails. Have you all considered putting the pollinator plants on the side of the trails? It's very depressing to just go on grass, which does okay, but it's not going to help our bees and our butterflies. And it seems like it would be a perfect opportunity. I mean, the DOT did a study uh, where they just planted the grass and only mowed the grass once a month, as opposed to every week and they found a huge escalation in the pollinators in that area. So I'd like to see if we can have some kind of plan for doing that. So the short answer is we have a test bed that we've done as well, not on a trail, but on one of the county owned properties to see how that would work. And, and unfortunately, it's all, it is kind of tricky um, to make those things happen. Where, where we find, especially on, a, on such a, a long, linear, narrow patch, if you will, um, where we're looking at that right now is where we have these destination trails that we talked about. So the, the concept for Rolling Hills, for example, right now includes that kind of development. And not just a little bit of it, but a lot of it in a, in a well, much larger area that's, that you can maintain and you can keep those things viable um, uh, with the kind of use that they receive. So the short answer is yes, we're still trying to figure out how we do those and do them well. Um, before we go ahead and spread them out, and then we're also looking at some other test sites to do that very thing and see how many different places we can have these. And 
Uh, just before we move on to the next and last question, I'd like to ask our next presenter to move towards the front of the room, because mm -hmm. um, we're going to jump straight into environmental, the environmental panel after this. So I'm curious um, how much of an appetite there is in Seminole County to rezone low density residential areas to high density residential areas and still work with an affordable home builder to keep it to keep it affordable for us to do something like that. Oh, and I'm, I'm with Habitat. So I, I think the what our, our land use analysis has shown us is that the areas that we have that have been designated for higher densities in our land use we have enough to, to meet our housing demand so really what we really want to focus on is making sure that we're um, utilizing the density in those areas first so before we start rezoning or, or looking at changing land uses in some of the lower density areas let's make sure that we're actually meeting the the goals that we have with the existing higher density area 